Hello everyone. Thank you for joining this interview, which is part of the Cambridge Judge Business School video series, CJBS Perspectives, Leadership in Unprecedented Times. My name is Gishan Disanayaka, and I am the Interim Dean of Cambridge Judge Business School. Here's a question. What do football, Cambridge Judge Business School, and I have in common? Well, it is my star guest, Alison Britton, Chair of Football's Premier League, a member of the Cambridge Judge Business School Advisory Board, and a student in the very first class of Cambridge MBAs that I taught in 1994. That's 30 years ago. Alison, it's a delight to welcome you. Gisha, it's fantastic to be here. I can't believe uh, that we are doing this 30 years later, but it's an absolute pleasure. Alison has been a former CEO of Whitbread and a former head of retail banking at Lloyd's Banking Group. She serves on the main board of a number of companies, including as chair of Dunelm, senior independent director of Experian and non-executive director of British Airways. She's also chair of the Prince's Trust Group of Charities. She has been a member of the Prime Minister's Business Advisory Boards for several Prime Ministers and is a former chair of the Financial Conduct Authority Practitioner Panel. Alison also had a champagne moment when she was named Verb Clico Business Woman of the Year in 2017 and was awarded, awarded a CBE in the 2019 New Year Honours for Services to Business. Alison has been a long-standing supporter and collaborator of the Business School. Alison, thank you so much for taking the time to join me in conversation. I'm going to start with that most pressing of questions, Alison. When did you become a football fan? Ah, well, um, as as with most people, I suspect, in the UK, um, I became a football fan as a child because my family were football fans, my grandfather uh, particularly, and then it followed all the way through from him. Uh, and so I inherited uh, football through the family line as a child. Uh, and that means I also inherited my club as often happens, which you pick up as a child and you never change. Um, and in my teens, um, I very regularly attended football matches. But just to give you a sense of how very old I am, I will tell you that in those days, I used to stand in the standing areas um, of the football stadium because they didn't have seats in those days. and They became all-seater stadiums much later on. So that's how my uh, that, that's how my love of football uh, commenced. Splendid. So, what was the club that your family supported? Uh, we uh, have always been uh, Manchester United fans. So it was Old Trafford and the Stretford End that I used to stand in as a child. That said, however, and I must say this to make sure that people don't think that I'm in any way a super fan. I'm not a super fan. I've not been a season ticket holder. Uh, and certainly during my, I guess, 20s, 30s and 40s, I was much less a football supporter as I had my kids and was very busy doing lots of other things. So it has been a real pleasure to return to being a football fan again. And I, I, one of the things I've enjoyed most about this year in my first year as chair of the Premier League has been seeing live football again. And there's something really special about seeing live sport. Um, I'm now, of course, a fan of all of the Premier League teams. Um, <laughs> I make it a point um, and, and my business that to visit um, uh, each club each season for a home game. And at that home game, I, uh, I'm seen wearing the home team scarf and I support the home team, who are obviously uh, giving me a fantastic day out to see their team play football. Thank you, Alison. You've had quite the career journey, from banking to hospitality to sport. Could you tell us a little bit more about your journey and any moments or transformative experiences that have particularly stayed with you? It, uh, it's a great question, Gishan, because my career has been going for 35 years. So there's a long period to cover. 
And I started my career in banking, uh, which was more of an accident than a design. I, I was a marketing student at university and I'd anticipated going into, into marketing and, en and ended up by some quirk, uh, which I won't go into now, um, in banking. But And I stayed with my first organisation, Barclays, for 19 years, which is a very long time. And indeed, I stayed in banking for 28 years before uh, before I finally switched sector. So, so a long period. And there were some moments in there that I think were quite important. And, and the start point of the important thing was, was the training programme, I think. Barclays was a great training programme, a great training ground for any graduate. It ran a very long graduate programme, which immersed you in banking across the whole company in, in a number of different assignments. Um, but they placed great value in Barclays on analytical thinking and analytical problem solving and structured management processes. So as a young person, you got you got a training and a grounding in a way, uh, essentially, that this organisation worked, which, which stood me in good stead, I think, particularly analytical problem solving and then being quite structured in the way uh, of developing um, my management style. Um, and they were a great way to learn and to sort of get a career up and running. They they offered me a change of role about every two years during that 19 year period. In the first few years, much quicker, but, but when I was an established manager. And that meant that I never felt I had to leave for something more interesting because each time I felt that I had learned enough, I was moved. Um, and so I was learning something new again and getting new skills and new and, and new qualities. And that's why I ended up really staying so long at Barclays because of the interest and the curiosity and the learning. Um, and of course, uh, I should say, um, and I'm sure you would expect me to do, uh, Gishan, to say that um, Barclays also were responsible for sponsoring me to do the uh, Judge Institute MBA which I joined the class of 1994, as Gishan said earlier, at his first uh, year also at the, at the business school. Um, and I graduated um, with the MBA in 1996, and Barclays put me through that programme. Now, that was pretty transformative uh, from my perspective, because I had been sort of relatively UK orientated. I had a year um, outside the UK as a student, but otherwise uh, I was pretty UK orientated. And um, uh, what I met, what I came uh, into with the judge uh, and with the business school was a really diverse set of students. So we're about 40 of us. And we were in um, about 26 or so different uh, industries and a similar number of different nationalities on the programme. So it was an incredibly diverse group. And I learned probably less from textbook learning. Um, apologies, Gishan, um, for, you know, in the corporate finance or the statistics route. Le less in that way. But I learned an awful lot about how different people are and how they have different approaches to problem solving, how they have different ways of of um, or, uh, uh, mental models of dealing with issues and problems. And that was hugely transform transformative for me in that it really broadened out my thinking and my thinking style. And I think that's again, been something that has been incredibly important to me. And it's, and it's kept me on this learning track, which I'm sure we will come on to, which again is another really important part of, of my career, is doing things that are going to stimulate and, uh, and cause me to grow. And, to, and that, that idea of lifelong learning is really alive and well. The, the other thing, of course, I had from the, from the Judge um, Business School uh, was some great friendships. Um, and uh, so, so it's great to see you here today, Gisha. We, we met when I joined the advisory board again. Uh, but I also see some of the students who were in my year. I'm very close friends with a couple of them. In fact, we holiday together most years. So um, that, that has also been the source of a lot of joy uh, for me. Um, if I then think, uh, if you're happy for me to continue, Gisha, just on this theme of the sort of long career, I will, if you're happy with that. Yes, um, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I moved um, after 19 years uh, from uh, Barclays. And whilst they have been really great at um, structured management processes, uh, managing people, uh, leadership skills, uh, analytical problem solving, they weren't quite so great at uh, speed um, and execution. And I moved um, in 2007, just before the financial crisis, to um, 
Abbey National. Um, Santander is the group, uh, but they owned Abbey National in the UK, which is a building society. Um, and that was a real culture shock for me. And therefore, a transformative moment, because I think if you, when you when you experience a significant change yourself, it does transform your thinking. Um, Santander is a Hispanic bank with very few sort of Anglo-Saxon type operations, really a very small business in the US and ourselves, Abbey, in the UK, where they'd invested. And we were also going into the financial crisis at the time. And so uh, during the first uh, six to nine months of my tenure at Abbey, we bought in distress during the financial crisis, the Alliance and Leicester Bank and the Bradford and Bingley Bank. And um, my, my job was to, uh, in running the retail part of the business, was to amalgamate all of those three banks uh, with a great deal of help and support with the IT and ops uh, function who replatformed all of those three businesses onto a, a new IT platform so that they could be uh, merged together. And we rebranded that business from Abbey, a and l and Bradford and Bingley, which were very old brands, um, so a very significant undertaking, to Santander which when I arrived uh, in 2007, there was zero awareness of the name Santander in the UK. Uh, I think it was most closely associated with a ferry crossing uh, and a ferry company. Um, and of course, we went from that zero awareness to being a massive brand on the high street. We, we, uh, we, we merged all three banks together and rebranded them as Santander. Now every high street has a Santander and everybody in the UK knows about Santander and, and understands it. It, that whole period for me um, was a very rich professional experience. And what one of the things I uh, culturally that was very different was an enormous focus on speed and execution, uh, as well as, you know, uh, 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 being good at the, the analytics and the, and the structure. So for me, it added a whole new um, side to my own um, set of capabilities. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed uh, um, working actually cross-culturally with all of the other businesses that sat within the Santander group. So uh, again, another sort of transformative moment for me. Um, my final role in banking was at Lloyd's Banking Group, and that was a different animal altogether. Um, it was in need of a complete turnaround. It, it had um, taken over... Um, the Halifax uh, business the, uh, the, the that was on the brink of going bust, the Bank of Scotland Halifax business, um, and had got then into financial difficulties itself during the financial crisis as a result of that. And so I joined as one of the team who were put it, who, came, who came together in the bank, put into the bank, to essentially get the taxpayer's money back because the, the taxpayer had bailed out the bank during the financial crisis. It was one of those banks. Um, and so I I ran the Lloyds uh, Bank uh, retail business, the Halifax business, and the Bank of Scotland business, uh, obviously uh, based in Scotland, uh, those retail banks. And I was there for four years. And we were we had a very um, uh, we had a very concerted effort to do all of the things that needed to be do. A very small number of items on a very targeted plan to get the outcomes that we needed. And and it was a very successful turnaround in that. The, the whole group returned to profitability. We returned uh, to capital stability and rebuilt the capital of the bank so that it was a stable and safe institution going forwards. We reinstated the dividends. Uh, we did get the taxpayers' money back. They were able to exit without, without losing money. Um, and we launched the TSB Bank, uh, one of the undertakings required by the European Union as a result of the bailout was that we reduced the size of the bank in the retail area because we were then uh, we had a very large bank with the TSB was was part of it. And so we created a new bank within Lloyd's called the TSB, uh, which had nearly five million customers, uh, about 630 branches and about uh, well, the best part of 10,000 staff. We carved that out. Uh, from a from an IT and operations and people and systems perspective, and launched it um, through uh, uh, through an IPO into the uh, market, and it became, I, I guess, the biggest uh, challenger bank in the UK uh, behind the big four. So again, another really transformative experience doing something 
that no one had ever done before. You know, a, a, not not anything that had a playbook associated it, with it, which you could have learned in advance, but a great professional um, a capability building experience. Um, and then finally, um, I, I made a move, which which was my last for in the corporate world. I moved to be um, the chief executive. Um, of the UK's largest and oldest hospitality company, uh, Whitbread PLC. So one of the great surprises of that move, I guess, from a market perspective, was that after 28 years in banking and with everybody expecting me to stay in banking and potentially be a CEO of a bank, um, that I would move completely out of my sector and join a sector that you know in which I had no experience at all. Um, and and of course, it was a fantastic um, learning opportunity for me. And I had a thoroughly enjoyable eight years at Whitbread. It was a fabulous, fabulous business. For those of you who don't know Whitbread, um, it owned the Premier Inn branded hotels, uh, about 500 pubs and restaurants. And at the time I took over, it owned Costa Coffee which was in about 26 countries and, and had about 4,000 stores. So um, a different sort of portfolio, but all hospitality business. Um, and there were quite a number of sort of big moments in that business that, um, that, that came to pass during the period that were um, new for me and therefore, you know, transformative. Number one, we rebuilt uh, over a couple of year period the cost of business, which had started to fail as well, started to wane in its appeal. And we rebuilt that brand, made it profitable overseas and essentially got it ready to be divested. And in the end, we uh, we sold the cost of business uh, in 2019, so just ahead of the pandemic of 2020, um, to the Coca-Cola company for £3.9 billion, which I think was something of a surprise to the entire market, um, how valuable that business had, had become and, and what a good deal that was. It was enormously helpful uh, to have done that deal as we went into 2020 and found ourselves in a world where we had a pandemic and where hospitality businesses particularly were at the forefront of being um, uh, in a very, very difficult situation. So we managed the, I managed the business through that whole COVID period. Um, we had no playbook for a pandemic at all. Um, and we had to shut the entire business at very short notice in, in March 2020, um, reopening it again um, in time for the summer that year, closing it again, uh, just after the Christmas and having it closed for five months at the beginning of 2021. So um, that that was uh, something that, you know, you couldn't have planned for in advance. But we, we had a great management team who, who were really brilliant and did a super job throughout. And we spend a lot of time supporting our business, supporting our people, particularly through all of this. Um, we, we, we kept hotels um, open to support the NHS, to, to house doctors and nurses, uh, and the emergency services. And we did a lot of work to support the national effort through that period, which was hugely rewarding um, and, and all very new. But when, as we as we were coming out of the pandemic, we were in an incredibly strong position as a business because not least because we had sold the cost of business and therefore we were not short of, uh, of capital and we were very, very strong balance sheet as a business. And therefore, as we came out of it, we spent a lot of time planning for the future and planning for future growth. And of course, uh, at this stage, having uh, a lot of hotels in the, in the UK, sort of eight, nine hundred hotels in the UK, uh, we really needed a growth runway for the next well two decades. And so we were able during this post COVID period to um, to look to the future and to build an international portfolio of hotels, largely in Germany. Um, uh, uh, to drive that growth, and we, we, you know, by the time I left the business, we had a very solid platform of uh, of eighty hotels in Germany, and that's a platform from which uh, the next two decades growth for Whitbread can be built. So it was a great way to to, to leave the business. I, I left the business uh, just last year in twenty twenty three, uh, and that's when I took on my portfolio of of, um, uh, of businesses, which you've already mentioned. Uh, and became what is termed uh, a plural uh, uh, chair or, or director, as it's known. So that, that's a potted summary, Gesha. I may have gone on for too long with those areas, but um, please do um, 
uh, please do ask me something else to stop me talking. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alison. <laughs> that was a fascinating and varied journey that you described. May I come back on one point and ask you why you moved from banking to Whitbread? As you described, that was quite an unusual move. So what prompted that decision? Well, it was an it was an interesting moment. We had in at Lloyd's, we had reached the end. We had a five year plan at Lloyd's to put the business back into the right shape to be a safe, strong, secure UK growth bank. Um, and, you know, with with the with the shareholder, the government shareholder to have exited and dividends to have re resumed and, and and to be a normal investable vehicle. Um, and that five year plan, we delivered it a little early. So we delivered it in four years instead. So we were at that point where we had just spent a bit of time thinking about the next five year horizon and what the next year, five year, five year plan would look like. And at that point, I decided that um, that I would move a, a role. So, I, you know, I, I'd reached the point that, that we had been a great experience at Lloyd, uh, Lloyd's. I'd enjoyed it enormously, but I didn't want to do the next five years in a, in a more business as usual environment, having had the excitement of this transformation. Uh, the Whitbread um, uh, role came from left field completely, uh, merely a, a, a request for a cup of tea with the chairman at the time, Richard Baker. I assumed the cup of tea was to talk about non-executive roles in the future, as chairman often talks to people about those. Um, I had a very good conversation with him and and a couple of days later, uh, headhunters phoned and said, would I like to be considered for the shortlist of, of the Whitbread job? And, and even at that stage, I think, I, should, I, I didn't really quite believe that uh, somebody would consider me as a move, you know, from banking after 28 years and into another sector. Uh, and I think probably the reason um, that I that I made the shortlist was I had for a few years been a non-executive director at Marks & Spencer's. Um, that was a... Um, a, a non-executive directorship, which my previous chairman had almost strong-armed me into doing, thought it was very good for my personal development, and however busy I, I was, I should make time for it. So I've been forever grateful uh, for his intervention at that period, because I think it made a really significant difference to me a few years later. It's amazing sometimes when you look back at your life and your career, you, you, a, a small intervention by somebody becomes um, much larger in its importance um, when you see how that plays out. So I went through their process and as I went through it, I got more and more excited about the prospect of A, the company, which has a fantastic culture and a, and a lovely business. Uh, I mean, everybody knows Premier Inns. I hope you all love them. Um, and you would know our restaurants and pubs and Costa Coffee, again, was a household name. Um, and so the idea of that business with its wonderful um, team and customer based culture uh, was something I really wanted to do. And it was a great opportunity for me, again, to learn something new, uh, be curious about something um, and, and to make a difference in a different sector. So it was just too insight enticing to say no when they when they offered me the job. As a board member of a diverse range of organizations, and thinking also about today's economic and geopolitical climate, what do you feel are the biggest challenges that boards face today? Ooh, yes, well, <laughs> that's a big question. Uh, and, there are, and there's lots of things that are very, very challenging at present. Um, I mean, I guess I'll, I start at the top um, in terms of the board's responsibilities to its stakeholders. Um, and in the UK, in some countries, that is a very tight definition and it's a responsibility to their shareholders. In the UK, uh, we are responsible to a much broader set of stakeholders than just our shareholders. But that, though that broad set of stakeholders that we are responsible for are, are increasingly different and sophisticated. Our, our investors themselves, our shareholders and investors are much more sophisticated and much more demanding of what companies will do and how they will do it than they ever have been. Uh, I think our customers are more discerning and savvy than, than they've ever been. Our, part, our suppliers are often needing to be our partners. We, we often need them to be our partners um, for things like climate change and uh, scope three targeting for climate change. So we are having to deal with suppliers and, and talk to suppliers and work with suppliers in a different way. 
our, our employees scrutinize us much more. Uh, they look at our mission and our purpose and our visions in, in a different way. Uh, regulators change the landscape, government and social groups and the use of social media to uh, to deal with communication means that messaging is much quicker and uh, forthright, more forthright than ever it has been. And of course, um, we all serve uh, communities uh, where we are based and where our customers are based, and those communities are more demanding of us. So there's a, there's a, there are a bunch of stakeholders, I think, that that want more and expect more from the companies that that work in their area and employ people and uh, employ suppliers and um, and with whom in, in whom we invest. And and those expectations are much higher than ever been. And a board's primary responsibility is to to work out how to to meet those expectations. And then on top of that, Gishan, you know, at the moment, we've just got a raft of um, just a raft of issues uh, that we're all grappling with. And, uh, you know, it's quite a long list at the moment. There's probably more volatility around than I've seen in, for a long time in my career. And my career is 35 years long. So, you know, I've had a, a fair number of, of uh, volatile periods within that. But this one, possibly more than most, we've, we've got a lot of macroeconomic issues. That we're dealing with not just cost of living but but more um and an increased volatility in that macro environment we're just coming out of a of a pandemic and all, all the, the systemic shock that that pandemic gave to nations across the world and which leads us to the fact we've got some geopolitical issues and sort of political polarization uh, going on across the world sweeping the world and, and in the uk too a lot of cultural changes happening a lot of IT changes. Uh, the the nature of risk and threat has changed. Cybersecurity is now probably most companies' number one threat, where you know thirty years ago it would not have been. Um, we have got environmental uh, and energy transformation. I talked about that a minute ago in terms of thinking about how each company is responsible to uh, make its contribution to reduce the threat of climate change. And then we've got the growth of new technologies. Uh, whether that is automation, machine learning, AI or, or generative AI, all of those things have got huge implications for both businesses and society. So that's an enormous amount, um, I guess, in terms of challenge for boards uh, to be grappling with. And, and as chair of two boards, I think, um, you know, the, the way to think about that is, is the need at board level to have very high quality directors um, very diverse thinking as well. So you, you can't afford to have people who just think the same way because you're going to miss looking around a corner, you're going to miss a risk, you're going to miss an opportunity. Um, we need board members that think strategically um, but but can can understand transformation and change. Um, and, and we need board members, uh, some of whom need to have specialist knowledge in some of these new areas that, that we may not have seen in our executive lives before we became board members. Um, and they have to be able to, I think, um, really do a juggling act as board directors in that uh, they have to balance the support that they give to the management team, which is incredibly important that the management team is supported and feels supported and is, is helped to deliver the uh, great outcomes that they want to achieve. But they also have to challenge and have open and, and uh, constructive debate with the management team. Um, and, and develop a sort of cultural environment where that is an accepted practice and way of working because that's the way that we're going to be able to grapple with all of the uh, different issues which which are emerging and, and are around at the moment. It's not it's not easy. It's not easy at all. To what extent should corporate boards collaborate with other boards in order to tackle some of these big challenges and risks? I think lots of lots of time we should, um, uh, providing we're never overstepping the mark in terms of uh, sharing market sensitive information or behaving like a cartel or putting structures in place which which would be anti-competitive. Um, where we can collaborate to get a better outcome 
on an issue which is of significance to large numbers of people and large groups of companies, which may not even be in the same sector, like environmental change. I think we should absolutely be collaborating. It's no good one company being really brilliant and everybody else failing, because that way we don't get an outcome for the environment that we need. We need everybody to be successful. So, So the sharing of best practice for some of those elements should be absolutely part and parcel. And I know on the boards that I'm involved in, um, everybody is very keen to hear all the best practice that they can so that they can bring that, what, what is the most relevant best practice for their organisation and bring that into the organisation and make quicker and speedier progress on some of the issues. But do you think that diversity quotas on boards could be counterproductive? Um, so we can get into a bit of a definitional debate about the difference between quotas and targets. And I, I'm always less keen on quotas. Uh, but what I am is an enormous advocate of targeting. Um, I'm, I'm an enormous advocate in, in every part of life, including business, for measuring what you think is important and setting goals for what you think is important and, um, uh, and being honest with yourself about the results of what you think is important. So the reason, uh, you know, the reason I say that and the reason it's important is in business, everything we care about, we measure. Um, and if you don't measure it, you you can't pretend to care about it. Um, everything we care about, we monitor. Uh, everything we care about, we set targets for. And everything that we care about, we look at the results and we see whether they are on track, or whether we could have done better, or whether we could have set more stretching targets if they're really good. Um, and that's financial activity and it's non-financial as well. So, you know, examples, uh, revenue, w- profits, returns, employee engagement, customer satisfaction, uh, marketing effectiveness, uh, you know, pretty much everything in a business that we want to do and change that we want to make, we will set metrics and targets for and we will monitor them. And so if you want to bring about change anywhere, especially in organisations, then you have to measure, monitor, target and publish your results. And that in, that, that that mere activity, that business activity inspires people within an organisation to achieve goals. It gives them something to aim for. Um, and in the case of diversity, that's exactly the same. It, it, we don't we don't target for more diverse teams just because it's the right thing to do. It is, of course, the right thing to do. And that's one of the reasons we do it. But we also do it because, you know, countless studies, millions of them have told us what good business it is and how much better performing a diverse team will be and how much better it will be to spot risks around corners and make sure that you navigate them successfully and how much better it will be to deliver customer propositions to our diverse customer base if you have a representative uh, senior executive and board. So, um, so, so I've never been against setting targets for boards, and indeed the setting of targets for non-executive directors, a thirty percent club, and the original thirty percent, now forty percent, for example, of diverse uh, uh, gender diverse candidates on boards, and then subsequently that moved to uh, ethnic minority diversity on boards as well. Those those targets that were set and the fact that we published the results and we can see which companies are managing to achieve those goals has been an enormous, uh, has had an enormous impact. And you can see that those in the results of what board diversity now looks like in the UK, it's, it's wholly different than it was 10 or 12 years ago. And that's been a hugely powerful tool to drive that change. Um, however, um, and back to the question that you asked, um, they aren't quote, they aren't necessarily quotas. Uh, you know, you, you don't um, have to disband your company if you haven't got the right number, but but you are sort of named and shamed. And I think that that's the right uh, area to go at. Quotas tend to make people feel uh, those that are the subject of the quota feel that they may have to explain how they got to where they were as opposed to getting there on merit. Whereas targets don't. You always take the best person for the job. Um, and, and those great people are those diverse candidates on those boards. But equally now... We still don't have enough uh, female chief execs and I would say female commercial managers that would come up through the line to be the next uh, level of chief execs. And the pipeline for those uh, positions is still not strong enough. And that's harder to target. It's harder to 
measure externally. Um, you know, one of the beauties of the uh, targeting for non-executive directors um, and diversity is you can point to the chairman or chairwoman of that organization and ask them why they haven't done their job in creating the right diverse board. That's much more difficult uh, with some of the other uh, roles externally. So I do think that we, we did get a lot of new female non-executives who've done a brilliant job on boards and they've been brilliant role models for people in companies to see that, you know, at the very top of their organization, there, there is somebody that looks like you as a female or looks like you as an ethnic minority. Um, but they, they probably did take some talented women out of the pipeline um, to be future chief execs or commercial directors in those organisations. And we've had, we're have we having um, to rebuild that pipeline and not quickly enough, in my view. The Premier League has also not been without its challenges. What does the future hold for the Premier League? Well... The Premier League, yeah. I mean, we could we could have a we could have an all day chat about the Premier League. It is um, the most amazing organisation, the most amazing sporting competition. Um, and I am uh, all, I'm in complete awe, really, of of um, of how brilliant it is. It's got an incredible number of fans. And that's not just locally, you know, whether you're a, a Manchester team fan or a Liverpool team fan or a Newcastle team fan or any of the London club fans, uh, they are, you're, you're the, you may be the local UK fan, but globally, across all parts of the world, we, we've just got an enormous following in the Premier League. Um, football, as you know, very is very strong in Europe, very strong in Asia and Africa uh, and Central and South America, very strong footballing traditions. And it's the fastest growing sport in North America now. And with them having the World Cup coming up in a couple of years time too, that I suspect that that speed of, of growth in North America will be even stronger. Um, and although English football uh, and the Premier League have got challenges and, you know, it's it's not easy and not everything is perfect by any stretch of the imagination, um, English football is the envy of the world. Um, uh, it's probably the best funded football and the best attended football pyramid, bar none, anywhere. And, of course, the Premier League funds that pyramid um, and uh, and the championship leagues one and two the national uh, the national leagues the grassroots football um, and it's a very unique situation that isn't existing I, I don't think anywhere else in the world that that the, there is that revenue share that goes from the Premier League uh, uh, that un underpins the strength of the entire football system in the UK um, and that is a really important component. It's why everybody should celebrate, really, when the Premier League does well, because when the Premier League does well, it shares it shares doing well with everybody else. Um, the Premier League is also an enormous soft power asset for the UK. Um, actually, the three the three most important assets in soft power terms are the Premier League, the monarchy, and the BBC. And I think you, you would recognise that when you when you think about it. It's known throughout the world. If you go somewhere uh, on holiday and people ask you where you're from, they will ask you what football team you have. And they will often have a, a Premier League or, or, or Championship football team that they follow in their country, but they, they follow it with us. So we have that influence um, uh, with people watching our sporting events, listening to our sporting events, and that sort of British influence of our values uh, through football. And we reach, I don't know, 800 million people around the world with that. Um, and in the UK, we're enormous economically. Um, I think we contribute something like £4 billion worth of tax uh, you know, direct tax uh, for the for the economy, and we support something like ninety thousand jobs in the UK. And of course, on top of that, you've got all the stuff that goes on in local communities with their local clubs. So the Premier League, being an entity of twenty clubs, each of those clubs in their own local communities invest an enormous amount of money in the local community itself, either through infrastructure spend or through physical and mental well-being activities, through training, sporting um, activity, development for people, job creation and getting people into work. There, there's a huge array of things that the, the Premier League foundations within the clubs do in their local um, local areas. So it's enormously um, powerful as, a, as an institution in the UK and an amazing 
a sort of winning machine. Um, so, I, I, of course, I've spent a lot of time thinking uh, since joining this year, the, the last year, I'm about a year into the role. Uh, you know, how has how has this come about? How how have we become this organisation and this footballing pyramid that is so strong and powerful? And it is, I think, down to investment over time. People have invested in the best players, and everyone in the world, you know, wants to come to Premier League. The best managers, the best coaches. We've invested in stadiums. Um, and that and all of that investment produces sort of really brilliant competitive football. And Gisha, I don't know if you're a football fan. You can tell me in a minute um, and tell me if you're a, a football fan and if so, which which club. But when I say the competition's really important, it is. The fact is any team in the Premier League can beat any team um, on any given day at any given match. Um which isn't the same in all leagues. You have some leagues in other parts of the world where one or two teams just win everything all the time and nobody else ever wins. And there's no doubt when one of those two teams plays that they're going to beat their opposition. That's not true uh, in our in our league. And uh, anyone can win uh, on, on any given match. Uh, at the moment, we've got probably five teams uh, that are in the title race, proper in the title race. And we've got at least a dozen vying for european qualification still and at the end of the season we'll we will have a significant number who are in a relegation battle it's it's really exciting and it's what makes people watch the premier league so um yes it's not without its challenges but i think it has an incredible future and i think you know part of my responsibility as being chair is to think about you know what this uh, or what this institutional organization what this sporting competition can be for the future and, and think about priorities for that so in this age of disruption can the status of the premier league be taken for granted oh definitely not no you have, no, 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 no. Nothing can ever be taken for granted. That That's the thing about change. If you don't change with it, then you get left behind. There's no two ways about it. So so the, the Premier League will be subject, and, and football generally, will be subject to all those same global challenges that we just talked about, um, in, in, you know, in terms of the, the external environment and the changes in sustainability and the changes in terms of technology. Um, and and we, we at the Premier League will have to navigate those change as well uh, and we do now have at the Premier League a, a, an independent a very diverse and independent board um, of, of high quality people who, who, who spend their time with, their, with the executive team and with the clubs um, thinking about those future priorities and, and thinking how we have to respond to the changes in the environment that we see so um, we will have to be sustainable we will have to be even higher in our um, energy for promoting diversity. Um, and we will have to find new ways of increasing our commercial revenues at home and abroad, developing new markets for our sport and for our league, um, because that allows us to continue to invest in the game, in the coaches, in the players, in the stadiums, which makes it something that fans will attend every week, week in, week out, and makes it something that people all over, the, all over the world want to watch, which is what generates the value, allows us to stay number one, as it, as it were. Any, any company that's a number one knows they have to work even harder to stay there than they had to work to get there. Um, and so, uh, and, and of course, given that we also support the pyramid and, and community and grassroots football and women's football, it's really important the Premier League does that and, and, and goes on to, 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 um, to, to manage commercial revenue. We also need to make sure that our financial regulation system, either our own, which we operate today, or ours plus um, what will be brought by any independent regulator in football, th that that regulatory uh, financial system can promote both the competition and the competitive balance is really important to make it vibrant and accessible and exciting for people. Um, but it's also important that it promotes club sustainability so that they do it in a way which means the club can continue to invest for the long term and be part of its community for the long term and commit to its fans uh, for the long term. Um, and then I guess if I'm picking out a couple more, and I'd say... Um, the technology side, um, as with all businesses, we will have to grapple with managing new technology. What should our platform look like in terms of development? How would uh, digital and content 
change? What sort of capabilities would we need um, as a league and as clubs uh, to continue igniting the enthusiasm of global fans and, and reaching global and UK fans? Um, and then, of course, the, I guess the highest priority of them all, of course, is, is, is maintaining this exciting and compelling proposition that we have um, and, and maintaining that position of, of being number one in the world. That allows us to compete against the very best um, and at the high and the very highest levels uh, with absolutely brilliant teams. And it allows us to support the whole of, of football and the pyramid and grassroots and community. And it also supports the economy, as I said earlier, the economic value and job creation value and the uh, value of infrastructure investment that is done through all of the clubs in the league uh, and in football more generally is enormous for the UK. And of course, um, it it binds communities. It, it, you know, football is a source of great delight for people and pride and it and it binds local communities together in a common purpose and a, and a, and a common goal of seeing their own team win. So I, I think it's an, it can be and should be an enormous force for good, um, despite the fact that we will be subject to all the same challenges as all of the other businesses that we are working with. Racism in sport and especially football, is a prevalent issue that has been widely covered in the media in recent years. How is the Premier League tackling this issue? Yeah, you, you are right. Uh, this, this is a big, big issue for us. And tackling discrimination, um, uh, racial discrimination particularly um, on the pitch and, and, and around the pitch, and increasing diversity much more generally, though, um, you know, not just ethnic diversity, but gender, uh, LGBTQ diversity within football. That is it. That's of enormous importance if we want to be a first rate winning um, culturally appropriate league for the future. So um, and, the, and the Premier League has taken an, an enormous amount of action um, to uh, to promote that level of diversity and to tackle head on. The, the sort of discrimination that you're talking about. So um, we've got a series of policies and, and processes in place, and you will probably have heard of the No Room for Racism initiative. You will have seen it in clubs and grounds if you're a football fan. It launched in 2019. Um, it's brought together um, all of the work into one area here so that we can get the game to be more inclusive and that the action plan uh, runs into sort of six parts and it focuses on tackling racism both on and off the pitch. It also tackles um, increasing diversity through, you know, um, it, uh, having pathways for people from uh, more minority um, backgrounds to come through coaching pathways, to come through executive pathways so that they're in the executive team running clubs and running the Premier League, um, coming through player pathways. So we've got, the, we've got balances within the players uh, work, as well as in the coaches and management pathways. Um, we, it, there's, a, there's a strand looking at workforce diversity. Um, of course, a lot on awareness and education because we do reach an enormous number of people um, through the Premier League, through the televising of the sport. And, you know, it's really important that we use that to promote better education for people and better awareness. And, of course, um, again, really importantly, um, increasing the amount of direction, uh, di sorry, di the, the amount of direct action that we could take, um, particularly direct action against people who are using discriminatory abuse either on social media or actually you know outside grounds or, or, or in football grounds so um we use uh you know parts of the calendar um for the premier league where we particularly strengthen our voice on no room for racism and we have strong messages to fans and fan groups making it clear that any form of discrimination is wholly unacceptable and there are now very strong sanctions in place um, for people found guilty of uh, of abuse, um, uh, you know, whether whether at a football match or online, and we will work closely with clubs always 
and the law authorities to take action when when we find that those, those cases are, of abuse are there. And and the clubs themselves have brought in you know strong sanctions against fans, you know, banning them from the stadiums or taking police action where they see that happen um, alone. So I think uh, as a result of that program, which is not going to end and which is only going to be, you know, strengthened and strengthened every year as we as we move forward. Um, there's been quite a lot of process um, um, uh, that's been put in place that's allowed us to make progress and allowed us to sort of check and look at statistics and see. But there's still a long way to go. There still aren't enough um, ethnic minority uh, coaching or managerial staff or executive staff within the league. Um, and we, we are now monitoring and targeting and measuring that activity. And we talked earlier about how important it was. If you want something done, you have to measure it, you have to monitor it, you have to publish the results. And we will be doing that within the league. That's enormously important. And, and of course, it all starts in the PL itself. Um, as I said before, we now have a very diverse and very independent board, both diverse from both a gender and ethnicity perspective. And we have um, an organisation called the Premier League Black Participants Advisory Group, which is made up of current and former players and coaches. And that helps shape and inform some of the, the, the league's ongoing action uh, in relation to um, anti-discrimination and anti-racism. So all of that packaged together, there's a lot going on and it's an important topic and it's one that, that should bear scrutiny and, and, and should improve over time. Alison, you once walked in the shoes of a Cambridge MBA student. Do you have any advice for our current students or indeed our alumni whose career journey is unfolding in such uncertain times? You know, it, it, oh yeah, it's very hard uh, to give uh, to give people uh, huge amounts of advice because you don't know that following in your shoes is going to be the thing that makes them successful. What what made you? Uh, successful at the time and in the environment that you were in may not be the right thing for them. Uh, but And I used to rail against this whole question about um, uh, being a role model. I used to rail against it. In fact, I used to say, please don't follow my uh, lead here because I made a lot of mistakes uh, when I was um, managing my career. And I, I certainly say to people who are um, in their careers now, especially young women, as it happens, because I often talk to, to women's groups, um, that they should plan and manage their careers a lot better than I did. And I gave them tangible examples of, of things that they could do and should do um, to think about what their aspiration is, to have confidence in being able to get where they want to go and then to plan the experiences that they want to have in the workplace that will give them the, the, the solid build of skill and capability to get there. Um, and, and eventually I, I have now at my ripe old age stopped railing against that whole that whole thing about being a role model because eventually you realize that you are one whether you want to be or not in that you are at a senior enough level a level that everyone can see you and for some people that's an enormously important thing to be able to see somebody who looks like them um at, who has made it to a senior position and it gives them aspiration and heart to be able to do so so i think if i was talking to somebody who was still in the in the in the student uh, arena and, st and and at the the cambridge um mba or, or at the judge business school i would say um you know when you're in the workforce um my best advice is probably um work hard just really work hard <laughs> be very curious ask a lot of questions, learn things that are new. Um, you, you learn a lot of things that you don't use right at the moment, you learn them, but at some stage they come back and they're really useful. And so I think actually, although there's a trite term about like lifelong learning and it sounds a bit worthy, it is actually really important. Um, you have to keep learning. You have to do new things. You have to do things that excite you and um, and that get you out of bed in the morning. And that's often that's often strengthening your brain muscle. Um, and as Darwin said, I think uh, many many hundreds of years ago, it's not the strongest of the creatures that survive uh, or thrive. Even it's those that are best able to adapt to change. And so, you know, try and make sure you're one of the adaptable uh, creatures in the world, because that is going to stand you in, in very good stead for your future. And then one last thing, 
if I may. Life is for living. Um, you know, life is, uh, you can't do it again. You can't redo it. You can't have another go. So try and enjoy what you do. Don't do things, um, well, certainly not for very long periods of time, that you really do not like doing or with people you really don't like doing them with. Um, try and enjoy what you do. Work hard and be curious and learn new things. Um, uh, and, and if you enjoy what you're doing, learning and doing new things and being curious um, is easy. It's so much easier with people that you like and enjoy working and learning with or, or, or on a subject or in a business that you enjoy being in. So that those would be my uh, less than wise words. <laughs> Thank you, Alison. I'm now going to put you under pressure. Who do you think is going to win the Premier League this year? <laughs> Look, if I had a crystal ball, um, you know, then I would be able to tell you that. But um, the Premier League is so exciting. There's there's at least five teams that will be vying for the title slot at the moment. And uh, no doubt they will battle that out right to the end of the season. And that's just how it should be. You asked me earlier, Alison, whether I was a football fan. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid I'm not, but you've just about made me interested. So thank <laughs> you very much. But you've not fully succeeded. But thank you so well, Gishan, much. Well, Gishan, in that case, Gishan, I will make you an offer. And, it, and this is being recorded, so I'll have to stick to it. I will take you to a live football game in the Premier League. And we'll That's arrange a time, we'll arrange a date, we'll arrange a match and come as my guest. Um, that sounds and, wonderful. And let's, let's see if we can't change your mind when you see some live football. Fantastic. I look forward to that, Alison. Thank you so much for such an inspiring conversation and for sharing your incredible career journey with us. It has been my absolute pleasure to host this interview and talk with you again. We are so grateful you have taken the time to be part of CJBS Perspectives, Leadership in Unprecedented Times with Cambridge Judge Business School. And as always, a big thank you to all alumni and other members of the CJBS community who have joined us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Gisha.